I am Prakriti Srivastava. I have worked for conservation of forests and wildlife for the past 28 years and I believe that to be my identity. I am an Indian Forest Service Officer and presently I am the Country Director of Wildlife Conservation Society India. Let me start from the beginning. I am the daughter of an Indian Air Force Officer. My father was posted to many scenic schools in the country. Many of these scenic schools lay beside natural forests, very rich ones at that. I remember some of my earliest memories are from the scenic school of Ghodakhal, near Nenital in the beautiful Kumau Hills. I was there from the first to the third standard and I remember it to be idyllic. The tall rolling mountains with the thick pine forests. I remember the calls of tigers and other wildlife at night, walking up a steep slope to reach school, rolling down another grassy hillside during lunch break, drinking ice-cold water from chashmas. Chashmas are freshwater natural springs. Even all our games used to be in forest settings. Probably the only devil in my paradise was mathematics, which was the bane of my existence. I remember an incident that took place during that time and had a deep impact on me. And now that I look back, influenced the course of my life. There was a teacher in the school, an avid hunter, and we kids used to flock around him due to his adventurous ways. I remember many an evening we sat at vantage points looking out for chital, sambar, and other wildlife. And one day, when none of us were around, he shot a sambar. When we kids heard of it, we ran into his house in excitement. And what I saw, I can never forget. There was a bloody sambar with big antlers, lying crumpled and dead, with glazed, lifeless eyes. And then reality hit me. This was the fate of one of the majestic galloping sambar that I had looked at in awe running in the forest. And the feeling of shock and uh, dismay and revulsion that welled up in me in that time is probably as fresh today as it was at that moment. And probably it is at that time that my love for wildlife and their right to live became a deep abiding reality for me. My father's postings through various places like Amravati Nagar, Imphal, Shillong opened my eyes to the beautiful landscapes, forests and wildlife of our country. Let me show you some of the glimpses of this beauty of our country. These are the Western Ghats. We all know that uh, Bangalore, Karnataka, Kerala lie in this area, as well as it starts, it starts extending from the tip of Gujarat. These are the Elephant Falls at Shillong. Really beautiful they are. These are the high, uh, high altitude grasslands at Irivikulam, and they are the source of so much of water for the downhill side of our uh, of the state. Look at the blues of the sea and the sky and how they merge together and how beautiful they are. That's the Andamans. Again, the Western Ghats. It's supposed to be one of the top eight biodiversity hotspots in the world. It's that rich in its biodiversity. The leopards, they are about 12,000 to 14,000 still in our country and they are really lovely animals. This is the Indian wolf. It is found in almost all parts of the world except Antarctica. But we should all know that while it belongs to a dry habitat, it is also having problems of loss of habitat because of which its numbers are also declining. The hyenas, it's a very shy and mysterious animal, also found in grasslands, again hit by the same problem of reducing habitats. The sloth bear found all over our country, but again, the same problem is what it also faces. The elephants, so beautiful and majestic, and we hear of it so often because of the conflict it comes in with humans when it moves. The rhinos, they were on the verge of just about a few hundreds being left in the country. But thanks to our conservation initiatives, it has recovered and there are as many as 2,000 now found in the country. Look at the beautiful seascape the, in an undermans. Again, while it is so beautiful, it is again 
troubled by issues of pollution, overfishing, building of ports and other such facilities. The Great Indian Bustards, it's almost on the verge of going. They are just a large, viable, a small viable population left in the desert national park in Jaisalmer. And if we don't do something as fast as possible, it will be gone on our watch during our lifetime. These are the beautiful birds of our country, again affected by fragmentation, loss of food, as well as uh, pollution. The beautiful Anamalai flying frogs of Kerala, also found also in the Anamalai Malai hills of Tamil Nadu. Look at this beautiful Pope pit, uh, pit viper found in the northeast India. And now, this is the Nilgiri Thar in Irvikulam in Kerala, which comes to my, brings me back to my story that probably it was fated, living close to nature and egged on by my name Prakriti, that I had to become a forest officer. I joined the Forest Force of Kerala in 1994 and after 28 years of experience in the awe-inspiring forests of Kerala and numerous sandalwood factory raids, encroachment evictions, countering smuggling of teak, sandalwood and timber, as well as working in positions in the central government, contributing towards policy of forest and wildlife, international conventions and many run-ins with politicians, I arrived at the firm belief if there is any cause worth fighting for, it is the cause of conservation of our natural resources. And that is the message I bring to you today. Our forests are magnificent and unique. But with this gift of nature comes immense challenges. Our forests, wildlife and biodiversity jostles with a huge population of some 1.3 billion people in our country. And they are faced with issues of, and threats such as fragmentation, of conflict, of poaching, and of illegal wildlife trade. Our forests in the country are less than 22% of the geographical area, and about 4.5% of that is in protected areas in more than 600 national parks and wildlife sanctuaries, within which about 4.3 million people also live. So we can understand that this lays stress on both people as well as on wildlife. And we know that wildlife requires space to live and to thrive. They also require space to move and they require to disperse. And then what happens? When they move, they come in conflict with our human habitations, with human beings, with our agriculture and with our uh, infrastructure. Let me just add another point that the tigers are known to move long distances. There are cases reported where they have moved from, the, uh, from Bandipur Tiger Reserve up till Shimoga, a distance of some 280 kilometers as the crow flies. Elephants, which are wide-ranging animals also, are known to move. So that's why it's, uh, I was telling you that when they, when they move, they come in conflict with our human beings as well as our infrastructure, etc. And what do we do? We see this so often on our roads, we see road kills. We also see that when they come in conflict with the infrastructure, what do we humans do in response to this conflict? We try to contain our wildlife into small locations and don't allow them to move as they are meant to. So what happens is that when we put them into small spaces, they either these are ineffective or we move the conflict from one place to another or we even heighten the conflict. We hear of so many cases where tigers are caught in snares, where leopards are burnt alive, where elephants are repelled by throwing diesel firebombs on them. All forms of cruelty in the, in the name of countering human uh, wildlife conflict. While it is absolutely important that human life needs to be safe, but don't we also recognize that we are the ones who have reduced habitats of wildlife. We have blocked their way with our infrastructure, with our habitations. And we are not ready to make even small sacrifices and adjustments to allow wildlife a way out of this conflict. We grow crops such as sugarcane, such as bananas, which are attractive to herbivores. And when 
animals such as elephants raid it, there is injuries and damage on both sides. While human beings have power over finding solutions to these problems, wildlife has no power to find solutions. And we humans need to find multiple solutions to this problem in form of either growing different crops or putting our livestock into pens to avoid attack by carnivores and allowing for corridors for animals to move as they are meant to. We should remember that we have the power to make things better for ourselves and our wildlife and we need to find those solutions and implement it. And if we don't do so, then the only end to this conflict is that we will decimate our forests and we will decimate our wildlife and it will be completely our loss if we do so. If we believe that there is someone else working for wildlife and conservation, then we are wrong. Each one of us has to get involved and find solutions to this problem. Wildlife, conservation and conflict needs bold solutions. It does not need ineffective, short-term solutions and cruelty in the name of addressing the problem of human-wildlife conflict. I therefore bring a concept that I think that we, it is uh, possible for us to implement. Why don't we think of a national wildlife highway system across the country which connects wildlife habitats so as to allow them to, uh, the, our animals to move and therefore mitigate co uh, conflict also. We could do it by joining it by a number of ways that we could think of. It could be done by uh, uh, interlinking fragmented wildlife habitats, by doing things such as voluntary relocation, land purchase, conflict mitigation, community participation and policy, policy interventions also. We should see that our country has such a huge network of roads and highways for people, for their easy and smooth movement as well as those of their vehicles. For this, we acquire lands, we get uh, uh, clearances quickly and every government considers it its duty to fulfill this requirement of the citizens. So why can't we think that even our wildlife requires uh, space to move and habitat to move? Why don't we think of national wildlife highways for, uh, for, for them? We could envisage a national wildlife highway authority which has the plans, which has the mandate and which has the funds to make this a reality which, which would actually take care of concerns of conservation and also allow for inclusive growth. For this, how do we citizens also help in this particular issue? As I said, each one of us needs to be involved and we need to find solutions together. First of all, we all need to be aware what is the issue so that we can intelligently contribute to it. Second is we need to engage with it. We need to have a dialogue and be a part of the dialogue as to what are the solutions that can actually ameliorate this problem. And we need to support causes. We need to support causes for conservation, for mitigating wildlife conflict with humans. And we also need to support uh, various organizations and initiatives for this purpose. I suggest please do visit our website that is www.wcsindia.org to learn more about this issue about conservation as well as conflict mitigation. To summarize it, I will just say this, that we need real solutions for our wildlife conservation. They neither have a voice, they do not have a vote. They have a future only through us and we can decide what to do. We can choke them out, we can cull them, we can castrate them. But if we do so, it will only be our loss. We can also decide to allow them their right to live and thrive as nature bestowed on them and on us equally. All that we need to remember is to take along our wildlife and our natural wealth in our march towards progress and development. We need to find real solutions to our conservation concerns. Thank you.